Welcome to the Love First Podcast. I am so excited that you are joining us for this episode because we are beginning a series that will take us right through the presidential election. We are barely over a month away, and just two nights ago, we got to experience the first presidential debate, which some people might now rename the uh, presidential debacle, but that's for another episode. But over the next several weeks, we are going to explore themes that will help us navigate this season. I want you to consider this question. What will church be like after the election? Specifically, the first Sunday in November is the first. The second Sunday is the eighth. The election is in the middle. How will our churches navigate this? What will be the difference between the first and the eighth? How will we think about people? How will we treat people? Who will we talk to and who might we be tempted to shun? This is a serious conversation, but we're going to enjoy it because see, at the Love First podcast, we are here to catalyze courageous conversations that help us revolutionize the way we love. So if you are returning, thank you for liking, subscribing, sharing, and engaging. And if this is your first time, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to our discussion this evening, which I'm going to title Aristotle, Jesus, and the Presidential Election. might be surprised that I titled the episode Aristotle, Jesus, and the Presidential Election, and you might think, well, what is that about? And how does that fit into this season? Why would I lump those together? Well, quite often when we're reading Scripture, we listen to Jesus' teachings, we listen in on His conversations, we see His interaction with other people, and we have a tendency depending on our age, to put a 20th or perhaps a 21st century spin on what we're reading and experiencing. But there are very important nuances from the first century context that can inform how we hear Jesus and how we understand the implications of his life and teachings. Just one such conversation is in John chapter 15. Now, I'm going to begin this. It's not unfamiliar to you, but I want to read this to you. My command is this, love each other. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command love one another. Now, I want to take a moment and focus specifically on this word, friends, and on the phrase, I now call you friends. When you think of a friend, what comes to your mind? Well, you know, you might think of a, a very intimate friendship, someone you've known a long time who, who is kind of allowed into the sacred places of your life. You might think, well, I don't know. I wasn't thinking that deeply. I was thinking about my buddies that I go golfing with, fishing with, uh, go uh, uh, enjoy an outing with. You might be thinking, well, I think friendship is kind of on a spectrum. Like, yeah, some people would be like, friend friends, like, like really deep friends, and other people, I, I don't know, I guess they would be more like acquaintance friends. Have you ever had someone introduce you and say, hey, this is my friend John, or this is my friend Alice, and you think, 
Oh, well, that's cool. I, I didn't know they thought of me as a, as a friend. Have you ever had an experience where someone introduced someone else as their best friend and it stung a little because maybe you had thought of yourself in that category? You see, the concept of friendship is extremely important to us, but it was also extremely important in the first century. And there is a whole history and a background and a culture that is wrapped around that word Jesus is using, the word friend. So if we back up a little bit and transport ourselves into that first century context, a couple of the things we would notice is that we don't have flush toilets and we don't have, you know, electric lighting. Well, okay. Beyond that, we still have people, we still have relationships, we still have families, we still have a centuries-old concepts about friendship. But in Jesus' day, in Jesus' time, in Jesus' place, and in the languages that Jesus used, the word friend has very important background. In 44 AD, excuse me, 44 BC, a Roman philosopher named Cicero wrote a book titled On Friendship. That book became a bestseller in that 40 plus years before Christ was born. In fact, that became such a bestseller and so popular, you can still buy that book on Amazon and it influenced the ideas of friendship for centuries all the way up until today. Authors throughout the centuries, researchers who were studying sociology and the nature of friendship, always referred to Cicero. Cicero was enamored with Aristotle's teachings on friendship that predated Cicero by at least three more centuries. Aristotle wrote extensively on friendship. In fact, in his writings to his son that we have preserved uh, for us as Nicomachean Ethics, he devotes all of chapter 8 and 9 to the concept of friendship. This is some of the most famous writings of friendship in world history. The, the research on this is profound, and if you study the research on this, it literally spans all the continents all cultures, researchers from east to west, north and south, want to know what did Aristotle say about friendship? And then how did Cicero incorporate that into his writings that became so famous that by the time of Jesus, the word friend had been defined by this Greco-Roman tradition of philosophy? If we look at Aristotle, there are a few things I want to start with so that we can lay the groundwork for this exciting series. First of all, Aristotle basically said what most of his teachers said, friendship is life. He asked the question, who would, who would want to live without friends? What would life be if you didn't have friends? Cicero echoes the same question. How could you assume that life would be worth living if you didn't have genuine friends with whom to share life? Aristotle outlined friendship on a wide spectrum, but he gave names to the friendship. He said, you know, that there's Friendships that we might uh, think about as friendships uh, of usefulness, right? That these are, are friendly interactions of people that find us useful to them and them useful to us. So you might say to yourself, yeah, well, that would fit like uh, some of the people that I played sports with. You know, all the girls on that state championship volleyball team that, that you were on. And you think, yeah, well, we were all really good friends. Well, Aristotle might point out that you became friends because the context of usefulness brought you together. You say, oh, no, 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 no. I have some really special friends out of that. Right. We'll get to that in a moment. You might say, I became uh, friends with the people in my unit in the military that I served with. Some of you might say, 
you know, uh, my college roommates or the people on my floor, my college baseball team, my high school soccer team. Some of you might say, you know, the people that I became the best friends with were the people that uh, walked with me when I had cancer, you know that those people you were in cancer treatment with, or maybe the nurses, the oncologists, the people where you uh, received your chemo treatment, you might think of them as as genuine friends. But what Aristotle might, might point out to us is, well, all of those friendships were kind of birthed out of this bucket he would term useful, usefulness. A second bucket is he said, you know, there's, there's friends of pleasure, right? Now, don't let your mind drift immediately to immorality. Friends of pleasure could be, no, 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 I've got a group of people that uh, during the soccer season when the Atlanta United is playing, you know, every game we get tickets together, we go watch together, we enjoy a party, and we, we just have a great time, right? Friends of pleasure. You say, you know, we've got a group of people that for years have uh, been vacationing together, and we might not see each other all year long, but we always look forward to that vacation time, right? Some of you are, are your, your mind is beginning to, to remember, oh yeah, well that's right, I do have people in my life like that. I've got people that I might not see for a long time, but we share this particular celebration. And boy, when we get together, we just pick right up where we left off. Is that resonating a little bit? And Aristotle would say, well, of course, that makes sense. You had friends of pleasure. It was the pleasurable experiences that brought you together. Now, what he would also indicate is, is that that pleasure can have a very positive or a very negative impact on your life. It might be friends of pleasure in a way that is upbuilding and good, or it might be friends of pleasure that leads you down the wrong path to darkness and consequence. But it's pleasure that brought that friendship together. Now, before we move on to his third bucket, one of the things Aristotle basically points out is, is that those first two buckets are often seasonal and temporary, and to a degree, superficial, right? So you're really good friends with a group of people, I mean, just so tight, like, man, you'd you'd literally lay down your life for someone, but after you got out of the military, or after you won that championship, or after you graduated from high school or college, you know, and life kind of moved on, you might have fallen out of touch with that group of people. You might remember them. You might even have warm feelings toward them when you think of them. But, you know, you might have had this experience. You might see a friend request on Facebook and think, I have not thought of that person in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And they do mean a lot to you, but we would all agree, I don't know if that counts as a deep friendship if you haven't actually talked to them in like 20 years. So Aristotle would point out that friendships rooted in usefulness or pleasure were normally for a season, temporary, and to a degree, superficial. But a third layer of friendship was what he called a virtue friendship. Those of you that have read a little bit about Aristotle, you were waiting for me to use that word virtue because this is embedded in his teachings. One of the things that Aristotle wanted to make clear was is that virtue is the is the pathway to happiness, right? You're not going to be filled with genuine joy, genuine happiness, genuine contentment apart from virtue. And so we should not be surprised that Aristotle said that the highest form and the deepest form and the most important form of friendship is a friendship rooted in virtue. Aristotle made some observations. He said uh, the probability of having a lot of close, virtuous friendships is not high. The truth is you would probably be happy to have a few deep, virtuous friendships in the course of your life. Cicero famously had one deep, deep, deep friendship, and it is his correspondence with this deep friendship that allows us to understand the bulk of his teachings about it. But what he would also suggest is, don't be surprised 
if you have only one deep, virtuous friendship over the course of your lifetime. You may have more than that, but they take so much time, so much energy, so much attention, and you receive so much from investing so much that the chances of having a lot of those friendships is probably fairly low. Another observation that Aristotle makes about that is when you begin to root a friendship in virtue, you are looking for the virtue in the other person, building the virtue in the other person, and helping evoke the virtue or mature the virtue in the other person. That person is doing the same for you. That person is looking for virtue in you, is building the virtue in you, is affirming the virtue in you, and evoking and maturing the virtue in you. Aristotle spoke of that kind of a friendship as um, something like another self, right? Like there's this other self. It's almost like you're mirroring each other, and it's that virtue that begins to flourish and really build that friendship. Now, here's something interesting. Think about this. If you have a genuine virtue-based relationship, a virtuous relationship, you will also find that they are pleasurable and useful. And Aristotle noticed that. That, that doesn't mean that a virtuous friendship isn't useful. That would actually be impossible to have a virtuous friend that isn't useful or you are not useful to them. And a virtuous friendship by nature is pleasurable because the depth of the connection, the growth, the encouragement, the affirmation, the development of each other, all of that leads to greater pleasure, greater happiness, greater joy. So that virtuous friendship or those virtuous friendships, as many or as few as they are, are useful and beneficial. Cicero agreed with this. He felt like that this was fundamental. Now, one of the things that kind of separates Cicero from Aristotle a little bit is that Cicero was kind of a man of the streets. He wanted to make sure that somehow friendship came out of the ivory tower and down to where people actually live. What does a virtuous friendship really look like? Oh, I mean, you can imagine one, right? Could you imagine a friendship where your friend never, ever hurt your feelings, never lied to you? I mean, even like a small lie, where your friend never had the wrong kind of anger toward you, or a friend never let you down. Well, sure, you could imagine a friendship like that. Cicero said, yeah, but you ain't going to have a friendship like that. The truth is, even in a virtuous friendship, there will be hardships and difficulties. Not every conversation will go as you wished. Not every exchange will yield understanding. You won't always have the uh, what we might term the fruit of the Spirit, not Cicero, but us, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. You might say, I don't know, if I took the temperature of my best friendship, some days might be a little lower and some days a little higher. Cicero wanted to make sure that the concepts of Aristotle were intact, that he wanted to affirm them and say that is absolutely true. But on the street, friendship takes some nuance. It takes some adjustment. That true friendship has to be nurtured by mercy and forgiveness and understanding. Well, that concept of friendship was the context for the way Jesus picked up that word in John 15. I'm sitting in a room right now as we're doing this podcast. I could look up and see what the ceiling tiles look like. They're not unfamiliar to me. I could look to the left and look to the right, look behind me or look in front of me and see the structure of the walls, all of them familiar. I could look down at the carpet, all of them familiar, because you see, in my context, the way that this room was built is built according to the familiarity of my culture. And here's what I want you to think about. Greco-Roman philosophy, specifically Aristotelian philosophy and Cicero's philosophy about friendship were 
the ceiling, the walls, the floor, the carpet, the paint of the first century. The whole culture into which Jesus came was the Greco-Roman culture influencing all of the local cultures. So, Jesus lived in Israel. So obviously, we know that they, were, they had Hebrew and Aramaic as their languages, Aramaic primarily the spoken language. But even when Jesus was crucified, do you remember that the charge against him was not just in Hebrew? It was also in Latin and Greek. That's how pervasive the Greek and Roman culture were in all of the locales of their vast empire. So you can't go anywhere in the Greco-Roman world and not experience the impact of Greek philosophy and the Roman iterations of that philosophy. So the word for friend that shows up in our Bible shows up in the Greek language in the New Testament. It's the same word that Aristotle was using. I want you to think about that. So when Jesus picks that word up and begins to work with it, it is already laden with meaning. All of those thoughts about usefulness and pleasure and virtue, well, see, they're all wrapped up in the philosophy of that word. Now, there's a few things we haven't touched on yet, and we're going to turn to them now. In that time, uh, Aristotle and later echoed by Cicero, said, you can't have friendship among unequals. It's not possible. There's no way for a colonel to be friends with a general. A sergeant can't be friends with a colonel. A private can't be friends with a sergeant. There's no way to, to, to have friendships among unequals. They took it further. Uh, husbands and wives in that day and time, husbands can't be best friends with their wife because they were unequal in that society. Parents cannot be friends with their children. They were unequals in that society. And you understand they didn't just say it from kind of a system of inequity. They said it from pragmatism as well. It just won't work. The rich and poor cannot be friends. If a man has a wealthy friend, they can never be truly friends because the, the man who at some point might be vulnerable and need assistance always has to remember that in every interaction with the wealthy benefactor. The wealthy benefactor is always aware that perhaps I don't have any real friends, but I only have people who are trying to be my friend in case they need me to be their benefactor. Do you kind of get the pragmatism behind it? So on the one hand, the wealthy person might want to be friends with someone who is less wealthy, but always in the back of their mind thinking, you know, they probably just want to know me for my money. The person that's poor might actually deeply admire the person with wealth, but think to themselves, boy, from a pragmatic point of view, if I was ever to get in trouble and I'm living paycheck to paycheck as it is, I sure wouldn't want to offend that benefactor and potentially lose that person who could bail my family out and maybe even be the key to our survival. So rather than that friendship being that ultimate bucket of virtuous friendship, it stays stuck in that first bucket of useful. Aristotle was firm on this. Cicero was a little less hardline, but he too believed you can't really be friends among unequals. We have a caste system. And the caste system says men are above women. The highborn are above the lowborn. The Roman citizen is above the slave. Uh, the highborn woman is of a different caste than the slave woman. The children until they reach a certain age, and specifically an age of manhood, not womanhood, would be considered of that lower caste. And friends, it just won't work 
if you try to bridge those gaps of inequity. So that's something very important to understand about that first century concept of friendship. So what do we make of it when Jesus says, I I actually no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. So let's explore that for a moment. One of the things historians note, and I'm speaking specifically those who devote their historical research to the concept of friendship, what they all note is that Christianity changed the meaning, expectation, and trajectory of friendship. That the expectations of friendship, the trajectory of friendship, the possibilities of friendship were actually philosophically shifted by Christianity. You see, when Jesus uses the exact same word that Aristotle used, Jesus uses the exact same word that Cicero used, and then says, I actually don't call you servants any longer. I call you friends. We ought to perk up and think, whoa, 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 what is he doing? What is Jesus saying? Because you see, the first one makes sense. Jesus is the master. We are the servants, right? And in that day and time, that wasn't a bad relationship. It was just a relationship that wouldn't qualify for virtue friendship. That would be a relationship perhaps of pleasure or perhaps of of usefulness, but not virtue, friendship. But hey, we know the rules. This is how it works. But Jesus isn't working off of those rules. You say, well, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Hold up a minute. I thought thought we're we're servants of Jesus, right? Uh, Romans chapter 6, we're slaves of righteousness, right? We're servants of Christ. Uh, Paul says, I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ at the the opening of many of his letters. Yes, yes. Yes, we serve Christ. We live to serve Christ. Jesus is the shepherd. What Jesus is articulating is, I am not going to stay with the definition of friendship that you have been given through these philosophies. The definition of friendship that says, I'm the Lord and you're the servant, therefore we can't be virtuous friends Jesus says, I'm breaking those chains. I am ending that approach to friendship. I'm offering something different. And that is the friendship that spans what appears to be the inequities in life. How does Jesus do that? Jesus says, well, let me explain. If you are only my servants... A servant doesn't know his master's business. Look back at John chapter 15. A servant doesn't know his master's business. So Jesus says, as long as we're only master and servant, and that is what defines our relationship, I won't fully reveal myself to you. You will never really get to know me fully. There will always be a barrier between you and and me. I will never be fully vulnerable to you. You will never fully know me. I will never fully be known by you. So you understand that there will be a barrier to intimacy because I'm never going to fully reveal myself to you. Jesus says that's the characteristic of a master-servant relationship. But Jesus said, you see, I've done something different. I've called you friends because, notice his wording, everything I learned from the Father I've shared with you. Jesus says, you understand, I'm an open book. Later on, the apostle Paul says, well, yeah, now we know as in a mirror dimly, but then we will know face to face. We will know fully as we are fully known. That's why Jesus could say that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will reveal everything to you. Jesus said just a few chapters later in John chapter 17, 
Speaking about eternal life, he said, this is eternal life. John 17, verses 3 and 4. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. What is eternal life? Knowing God. Jesus, in that same prayer, says, Father, the kind of oneness that I want us to have with our followers, not just our followers with each other, but the kind of oneness I want our followers to have with us is the oneness we share. So what is Jesus saying? What he's saying is, of course I'm your Lord. That's your baptismal confession. Of course you're my servant. But you need to understand that our relationship does something more. We are friends. Virtuous friends. Well, you say, well, maybe he just meant useful friends. No, no, no. Because he said, let me define the friendship I'm talking about. It's the friendship where we actually know each other. Historians note that as Christian writers and philosophers, especially in the 5th century A.D., 6th century A.D. and beyond, begin to reflect back on Jesus' teachings and then compare the philosophy of Aristotle and Cicero with Jesus, the lights came on and Christian philosophers begin to think, whoa, 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 whoa. What did Jesus do with friendship? How did Jesus change friendship? How are we supposed to understand then the potential for friendship, Christian friendship between a husband and a wife? And between parents and their children, children and their parents. Between a Christian business owner and a Christian employee in that business. Yes, you see, Jesus begins to say, I'm not obliterating the roles that you would play in particular sectors of society. I am just saying that your relationship in Christ transcends those roles. It is no longer true that the differences in our savings account or in what we take, uh, have in our take-home check It is no longer true that those separate us into different castes or separate us into unequals. No one in the body of Christ who has a need should ever fear that they would lose friendship if they had to reach out to somebody else in the body of Christ for help. Is that what you read in Acts chapter 2? Verses 42 and following were those first 3,000 believers that come from 14 language groups on the day of Pentecost and they're all baptized into Christ and the Bible says that you know they had everything in common. Isn't that something? The choice of words. What do you mean they had everything in common? They were helping each other spiritually. They were helping each other financially. They were helping each other with housing and food. And there was not a needy person among them, chapter 4 of verse Acts says, but that's not because that they stacked them up with the wealthy Christians helping out the poorer Christians. Everyone were friends in Christ. Some had more, some had less physically, but we also know that that also shifted where the apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, that sometimes you have a lot and you're sharing with the person that doesn't have a lot. And then the wheel of economy turns and they have a lot and you don't have a lot. Do you understand that the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 about economics in the kingdom, he says, our goal is not that some would be hard pressed while it's easy for others. Listen to his wording. Our goal is equality. Check that out in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You see, picking up on the teachings of Jesus? No, it's not. We, we understand it. You look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You begin with the Macedonians in the first part of that chapter, and the Apostle Paul says they were living in extreme poverty. Compared to the Corinthians, the Corinthians were living in wealth. 
The Apostle Paul does not say, well, you know, that makes the Corinthians more important and those Macedonians should probably watch their P's and Q's because, you know, they don't want to make the Corinthians mad and maybe lose a future benefactor. The Apostle Paul says, no, what we're talking about here is equity and equality in the body of Christ because Jesus is the one who started it. Yeah. Hey, think about this. Think about this for a minute. Now, let's follow this train of thought. Who is Jesus? Well, you say, uh, carpenter born at the east end of the Mediterranean Sea, mom and dad, Joseph and Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, that's the one we're talking about. Yeah, John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and apart from Him, nothing was made that has been made. Chapter John chapter 1 and verse 14, what does the Bible say? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the one and only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. What is the theology of Jesus Christ? It is that Jesus is the eternal Son of God. Philippians chapter 2, He did not regard His equality with God something to be held on to at all costs, but He emptied Himself in order to carry out the plan of incarnation and the restoration of, re of creation so that we could be restored to God. Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is the Creator, the Sustainer. Jesus is God in the flesh. If there was ever a time where we would think to ourselves, wow, well, that's an unequal relationship. Uh, what am I supposed to become friends with the God of the universe? Abraham might say, well, actually, yes. The God of the universe did call me his friend. Moses might say, well, I'll tell you what. Of all the things I pondered later in life, when the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob called me friend. What do you make of that? And Jesus says, you see, when I said that I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends, because you see, you do know everything about me. I have revealed it all to you. Jesus said, this isn't new. This is who God has been all along. Now, do you notice that Jesus doesn't reach out and kind of give a backhanded smack to Cicero or Aristotle? He doesn't look back and think everything they said about friendship is wrong. Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says, let me clarify that what they said about friendship being impossible between unequals is absolutely not true. And Jesus says, I'm going to get this thing put back on the right track. I'm going to get this train back on the rails. Friendship is about a relationship where, over the course of time, we have an increasing vulnerability and a decreasing fear, ever-increasing knowing each other, ever-increasing love. As the vulnerability increases, the fear is always decreasing. He said, you understand, if, listen carefully, if I can be friends with you, you tell me who's in some class or caste or race or gender or economic position to where somehow you are apparently so superior to them that they don't qualify for friendship. You see, this is radical. If there is anything we need restored... In this nation right now, it is Jesus' radical teachings on friendship. That genuine friendship breaks down all those false strata that separate people out, make people feel like they're high class and low caste, that develop and sustain the American caste system where some people in a certain race are looked one way and other people in another race are looked another way that by your color you could be considered the supreme race 
or you could be considered the slave race that was birthed into the DNA of this nation. And Jesus comes along and says, you know, you got it wrong. And if you folks are going to call yourselves Christians, you're going to have to look at how I approach friendship and you might have some real soul searching to do. How did you allow friendship to degenerate into the idea that friendship is primarily about usefulness? Who can do something for you? Who brings you pleasure? Whatever happened to virtue where in this relationship you are serving as mirrors for one another and affirming the virtue that is present and evoking the virtue that is still needed to be developed? Woo. you got to admit Jesus is on to something here, isn't he? Well, some of you might think, hey, now wait a second. You said there were, there were two things about Aristotle's philosophy that we hadn't brought up yet. You've only addressed one of them. You, you talked about this friendship among unequals. What was the other one? Well, here's the other one. And this one is why I titled the podcast Aristotle, Jesus, and the American Presidential Election is because Aristotle said... The purpose of politics is to develop friendship. Research it yourself. I know. The purpose, the purpose, the purpose of politics is to develop friendship. You say, well, boy. If that's the case, we're, we're getting an F right about now, aren't we? Just let your mind drift back. If you watched that presidential debate the other night, you're like, that wasn't even close. I mean, that was like the opposite. You're right. It was. You see, these are sobering times. You say, well, how does that even work? That, that the purpose of politics is to develop friendship. Well, Aristotle, as you might know, he had a lot of integrity in his philosophy. Here's what he said. Now, now this is Aristotle, not Jesus. Aristotle said, you do realize that the, 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 the most important human activity is philosophy. What do you mean by that? Well, let's put it in modern terms that philosophy is the process of thinking rightly, thinking well, thinking with integrity about life, and what it means to be human, what it means to be you, what it means to be you as a part of the general populace, what it means for you to participate in the lives of the people around you. And what does it mean to pursue the things that lead to virtue? that lead to the good life, the blessed life, the virtuous life, the happy and joyful and content life. Quick question. Let me take your temperature. How many of you would like more joy? You're like, well, yeah. Oh, well, let me ask you a different way. How many of you like less joy, like tomorrow? We're going to lower your joy quotient. You're like, no, 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 no. I want more joy. Okay, good. How many want more peace? Well, yeah, of course. How about more contentment? You're like, yeah, I could use that. Okay, good. How many of you would like uh, more happiness? You're like, well, yeah, of course, right, you know? How many of you like just more of that good sense that life is virtuous and meaningful and blessed? You're like, how about blessed and highly favored? Let's go with that. We want to be blessed and highly favored. Aristotle says, awesome. Then you need to really do a great job in your thinking. You need to think well about life. Think well about yourself. Think well about the meaning of your life. Think well about what it means to participate with the people around you in a beneficial way. Because the chances are they might be wanting more joy, more peace, more contentment. They too might want the good life, the virtuous life. So you think about how you want it for you, how they want it for them, how you could work together to develop that. And so what Aristotle preached was... If you really want to be great at philosophy, 
meaning everything I just described, great at thinking about life in such a way that life is blessed and highly favored for you and blessed and highly favored for others. He said, you know what? You can't do it without a virtuous friend. Aristotle said you can't do that without a virtuous friend. Aristotle, there's no way to do that on your own. You just don't have it in you. Nobody does. No one can get to the absolute best, most virtuous thinking on their own. And, and just a useful friend won't get it done. You know why? Because they're kind of like a servant and they don't truly know your business. You can deceive them. You can tell them partial truths. You can withhold from them and maybe for good reason. A pleasurable friend, same way. Who wants to upset the party by talking about what's really going on inside? See, so Aristotle says, you understand, you can have pleasurable friends, useful friends, but it's that virtuous friend that makes you the good philosopher. It's the virtuous friend that helps you get to the kind of thinking that helps not only you, but all those around you be blessed and highly favored. Now, do you see Aristotle's train of thought? If philosophy is the best thing a human can get a hold of, meaning great virtuous thinking about life, and can't do it without a friend. Then what Aristotle understood was, if we want the politic, the body politic, the word politic and polis or city or people all come from the same root word. If you want the people of your church, family, community, neighborhood, school, business. Uh, if you want the people of your city, your county, your state, if you want the people of your city, state, and nation, if you want the people of your city, state, nation, and continent, if you want the people around the world to be thinking about and living into what makes the whole world flourish, what makes the whole world be blessed and highly favored, if you want your people thinking like that, they've got to be friends. So what is the role of politics if not to help people form virtuous friendships that make them better for each other? That's revolutionary. And Jesus says, I don't disagree with any of that. The only major fault in all of that is that you believe there's unequals, that there's tears in society, strata, caste. Jesus said, that is not true. If I can be a friend to you, there is nobody that is by caste, race, economics, education, that is somehow underneath you or above you and therefore disqualified from friendship. So I got a question for you. How important is friendship in this season of American history? You might be moderately depressed because you might be thinking, good grief, if the role of politics is to develop a citizenry where we understand the value of virtuous friendship so that we become better at thinking about helping each other flourish and be blessed and highly favored, you might think to yourself, we're sunk. We are doomed. Our government isn't functioning like that at all. Well, you know what? You are correct. Our government is not functioning like that. That's why as believers, our kingdom is not of, is not of this world. We do not take our cues from a government that does not know how to behave 
and teach the citizenry by example how to help each other flourish. We have, we have a, a kingdom above that. The kingdom of God. And that God obliterated the strata came in human flesh. You know the story. And in just a few months, we'll celebrate the story. Born in a manger to peasant parents. Grew up as a day laborer. The God of heaven and earth walking around in flesh without even a pillar to lay his head on. He reached out to the wealthy. Zacchaeus. He was buried in a wealthy man's grave, Joseph of Arimathea. But there wasn't a person, a poor person, a sick person, a person of another race or religion that Jesus overlooked by caste or race or economics or education. You see, if the God of heaven and earth can teach us how to be friends... That's the one I'm going to follow. And I urge you to do the same. So over these next several weeks, as we explore Aristotle, Jesus, and politics, I urge you to think about what Jesus taught us about being friends and the impact of friendship on all of us flourishing and being blessed and highly favored. Thank you for joining us for the Love First podcast. I am so grateful that you engaged tonight. And what I would ask you to do is I'd ask you to like, subscribe, and share. Invite your friends to watch it. It will be on several platforms where you can follow along on our podcast. And we look forward to seeing you next week as we explore this more deeply with a specific example from a recent occurrence where people are now trying to figure out how to use friendship to heal wounds and help people flourish. Love first, I know.